So since we're cramming everything into today, or into class on Wednesday, the next thing we're going to talk about is how do we choose your research method? So choosing a research me method can be a, an extremely daunting task. But the first thing we have to do is make sure that we review the literature. So we're not going to choose our research method before we've reviewed the literature and before we've thought about all the extenuating circumstances that can happen as we're conducting our research project, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to think about all the things that can go wrong, all the generalizations, all the compromises we're going to have to make along the way, and then design a project around those things. And for many of you, the biggest thing that you're going to have to do is compromise on time. You don't have a lot of time to get the project done. And so what is going to be the strongest method that ensures I get the project done in a timely manner? So when you're, re when you're reviewing the literature, we're going to try and make sure we make informed choices. All right, so what you don't want to do is to replicate pre-existing research. You want to know exactly what research has been done on your on your topic. Where are we in kicking the kicking the ball down the field on this particular topic? And then we have to think about our research design. What are the variables that are going to be in play? And Julian's going to talk about operate operationalization of these video of these variables. So there are two different types of research methods that we think about. We think about quantitative research, which is mainly uh, statistical analysis. You, so you're focused on what the numbers tell us when we're doing quantitative analysis. And then qualitative research tells us the non-numerical data. So it tells us exactly how people are feeling, the verbal data that comes along with the research rather than, rather than measurements. Now, all the data, whether it's quantitative or, or qualitative, can be subject to interpretation. So even though you've objectively done this study, the results are almost always subject to how you feel or what you feel the data, the data is telling you. So when we're using quantitative research methods, we try to, we're trying to determine the relationship between one thing and another thing. For example, we're trying to determine the relationship between smoking and, and being in university. We're trying to determine the relationship between smoking and owning a dog. So do, do more people who smoke own dogs in Malaysia, right? So it's all about the demographics. So the research designs can be either descriptive or it can be experimental, right? With the, when you're using a descriptive study, you're only talking about the relationship between the variables, right? But when you're doing an experimental study, you're saying this is the relationship between the variables, and this is what this is this is what the ca the causality is, right? So this is why these things relate to each other. So there are different types of quantitative research methods. You've got surveys, which many of you are familiar with. You can either, you can create a questionnaire and you call people or you give them a computer and have them, have them fill it out or you email them the survey and then you, then you have them fill it out. When you're doing a survey, all the people are going to get asked the same question at the same time. You get the results and then you analyze those results. You can also do quantitative research by observations. So, for example, if we want to say how many people in red shirts walk around Sunway Pyramid every day. So we can stand at Sunway Pyramid and count, give a tick to every single person we see wearing a, wearing a red shirt and then come to a conclusion. You can also use secondary data, like, uh, for example, a newspaper. Right, you can use a newspaper and then count how many times the Najib's name comes up in a headline for the past year. Right, so we count those things 
all of those things are quantitative. Anything to do with quantitative is going to be numerical. So some of the strengths of using a quantitative research method. It allows you to have a very broad study. You can use lots and lots of participants depending on your time frame, and then you're able to generalize the results based on the participant, the number of participants you've been able to capture. Because you're not constantly changing the research question or there is no dilly-dallying around the research question, you're not asking follow-up questions, it's just the questions on the paper that get answered or online that get answered, then there's a whole lot of room for objectivity and more accuracy when it comes to the, to the, re to the, to the results. The good thing about doing surveys or any type of quantitative methodology is that the study is very easily replicatable. Right, so I can just hand somebody else my study. They change the the name, maybe slight number of the parameters, and then they can do the same study all over again. We're also able to summarize the information. We're able to make categories, which I mean, make comparisons between the variables, and then you get to give yourself some amount of distance from the study because once you've created the questionnaire, your feelings no longer come into play. Right, it's all the, the computer does all of your analysis for you. Some of the limitations involved in quantitative. While while we can see that quantitative methodologies can be very efficient and they're able to test hypotheses very easily, sometimes you miss the context. So the sky is blue, but why is the sky blue? Not necessarily that example, but, but you, you're not able to ask the why questions when you get the numbers. Sometimes it can all, it, because you're not able to follow up with some of these why or how questions, then the approach can be seen as static or rigid, rigid or, or even inflexible. So because the researchers put the, put the questionnaire together, this can lead to structural bias. So you have used your bias to put these put these questions in play because you know that it's going to yield a certain number of, of results. As I said, because you're not able to answer the how or the why questions, it means that you don't get the reasons why people behave this way or what are the attitudes or motivations toward a particular topic. Sometimes the data that we're going to get is going to be very superficial. There's no in-depth analysis that you're able to do into the data that's necessary. And then when you look at the numbers, they don't necessarily, necessarily reflect how an entire population feels. It could just be a certain subset of that population. And so the, the results sometimes aren't as generalizable as they should be. So then we move on to qualitative research methods. So when you're when you're dealing with qualitative research methods, the emphasis is on qualities, on processes, on what does this mean, right? So we're looking at how is the world constructed, what is our reality, what's the what's the relationship between the researcher and the topic that they're looking at, right? And so we're focused on this whole idea of the way our social experience is created and what, what does all of this mean? Many scientists believe that qualitative is a much more perceptive way of investigating phenomena, right? So you're able to dig a whole lot deeper and gain further information on a particular topic. So some of the things that we can use when we're using qualitative research methods we can do interviews, which may be structured or semi-structured or unstructured. We can use, we can do focus groups, which can involve multiple participants or just a few participants. It's as large as you want your study to be or as large as you want to be able to, to, uh, to collate and analyze the data. We can use postcards, which are small scale questionnaires that you can that you can ask to a group of participants and have them write the results down in their own words. You can use secondary data like like uh, diaries or newspapers or company reports, and then you could also use uh, observation. But the observation tend to the observations tend to be under a very managed laboratory like uh, 
context when we're doing observations as part of our qualitative research method. So some of the strengths of qualitative is that we're able to obtain a more realistic view of the world we live in because we're able to ask these questions. And then we're able to get, because we're able to ask these questions, we're able to get a different perspective. We're able to immerse ourselves in the situation. And as a result, the, the results are directly related to, to our immersion. We develop flexible ways of collecting the data. For example, if I ask a question in an interview, during a qualitative interview, you're then able to ask follow-up questions that can lead to helping you to define the way you want your research to go and to help with your analysis because you understand the underlying motivations that come along with these, with these ideas that these people are spewing or espousing. The other thing is that they're, you're able to tailor the data based on local, your local situation, the conditions you're experiencing on the ground, maybe as you move from Sabah to Sarawak down into Peninsula. You're able to interact with the people on their level. So it's a very intimate type of, of research method when you're, when you're doing qualitative qualitative research. Some of the limitations, because you're asking all these questions and you're you're being exposed to all of these new and big ideas, sometimes you can drift away from the original thing that you intended to be doing your research on. So you've got to make sure that you stay focused. You stay focused on, on the, the, what it is, the topic you're trying to research. Now that doesn't mean that you can't deviate, okay, but you always have to bring it back. Based on the information that you have, you can arrive at 500 conclusions. But hopefully when you have your theory, that's able to, to give you your foundation. Replicating qualitative studies can be very difficult because in the field conditions change all the time. And you're, you're never ever able to capture the essence of that when you try, when you try to, to replicate it. There's a huge thing on ethics, and Julian would have talked to you about the ethics in one of the videos. You always have to think about the ethical considerations when you are interacting with people or children and how your own personal biases affect, affect the research. Um, it takes a lot of time when you're when you're gathering data for qualitative. It also takes a lot of time to transcribe that data. And if you don't have the time to do it, sometimes it can be a very, very expensive prospect. Sometimes it's very hard to test the reliability of a of a quantitative of a qualitative study because the researcher can employ so many different techniques in order to get their respondents to respond in a certain way. And so those are some of the limitations involved with putting together a qualitative study. Now, when we're putting our study together, we're always going to have to test for validity and reliability. So data seems to be valid when they measure the factors or factors factor or factors you intend them to measure, all right? So if I'm going into a study to measure censorship on Twitter, at the end of the study, I, shouldn't be me I should not be measuring news papers and their interactions with ordinary Malaysians on Twitter. It should still be censorship on Twitter. And then, for example, when we're looking at reliability, it means that the data that, that were, were measured, they're measured consistent, consistently and accurately. So if we're going to do something like a content analysis for a newspaper on, let's say, how many times Najib names end up in a headline, we need to put together a coding book that shows that we reliably and consistently tested for how many times Najib's name appears in a headline. So some of the questions I need you to ask yourself when you're putting your methodology together. What type of information do I need? 
who can get me this information? Can I just get this information out of a newspaper or do I need to go talk to journalists to get the information that I need? Will it be valid? Will it be accurate? Will it be reliable? Now, what primary research method would best help me give the information that I need? And when I have my information, would the audience that I'm trying to target approve of the way I've collected my information? Now, if you have any further questions, be sure to ask them in class.